um, is that this one, we are looking at dimension h being finite. That was the condition that, um, well, well, actually it's not, I was, I was wrong. It's a, a minimum metric problem is, does not require any of those. All right, h is a subspace of v, okay? Then we're looking for minimum value of um, v minus u as u varies, right, in h. That was a minimum value problem. All right, v is given, fixed, and we want to find h, um, elements in h that is um, as close as to in the v. That's a minimum value problem. And the homework problem was saying that if h is infinite dimensional, and that minimum might not exist. So you're supposed to disprove there is no point on element in a perpendicular. All right, um, so that's that. And here is the theorem and the dimension of H being finite um, allows you to, there is one and only one, right? U zero in H such that, what was the property? u minus u0, v minus u0, given v, that's important context, is a zero for all u inside h. That was a theorem. And we proved there is one last time. We're going to prove today um, that's the only one. And remember why we even considered this one? That was a three-dimensional case. This one kind of visualized this minimum problem. Here's H plane. That where is the minimum? It is this condition right there. Right? Now we have to push that. It is not just that three-dimensional case. That U0 that I defined over there is the minimum. That's the so I'm stating it as follows. So that's a pretty nice statement there. So I'm going to use it. V minus U0. That one, we have it here, one and only one, is as small as ever possible of V minus U in here. That's the minimum uh, statement in mathematical form, H. Those things we want to understand not only for R3, but in general and in this, in this case. And there is this thing there. And you need to understand where is the finite dimensionality of the subspace is actually used and where it breaks down and hope that um, when we go over a solution, and you will also see that if you haven't discovered it yet. All right, so here is a proof of one, especially uniqueness. All right. We show that there is one, so we have to show that there's only one. It's, this is so obvious in the three-dimensional world, but if you don't see it, nothing is obvious. You have to, you have to prove it. All right. What is it then? We have to show, all right, here's a u0 and u1. This is typical u0 prime, such that v minus u0, u is 0, and v minus u0 prime, u is 0, for all the u's involved in h, right? Suppose that the y is that two things are the same. Um, we want to conclude that u0 is u0 prime, right? And all that we have is like a inner product condition. In the inner product condition, to pulling out something is equal to something is very difficult. Inner product itself is only about scalars. It's not about vectors. So if you just randomly trying this bilinear algebra, it's very difficult to get the conclusion is it has to be equal. So where is it coming from? Is this property that v v dot uh, if it is a zero, and then we have a conclusion. This is called definiteness of inner product. It has to be zero. So this is the only uh, part of the axiom that allows you to conclude from the inner product condition. Actually, if it is a zero, we know it's actually zero. So this technique shows up in several times. Okay? Yeah. So 
it's about u0 and u0 prime and maybe you're going to keep this u here same and so that we can combine these two if i have u and u different it's very difficult to combine these two to to see the linearity in here you got to have the second slot the same to linearity in the second one in here you got to have a first slot the same i want to get rid of v so that is condition about u so i keep this uh, general u in here how do you get rid of it can we subtract those two right then what happens? Yeah, v minus u0 minus v plus u0. I hope that's clear. Yeah, just like a dot product. Here's kind of common factor in there. That should be 0. And then, what do you see here? u0, I, I missed one prime here, right? Yeah, u0 prime minus u0 is u equals 0. Now, this statement is about everything, right? Now there is a trick. You can just hit U with one element. You can put in anything in there. You can put in one element, and then you're going to conclude the U0 must be equal to U prime. What should be that U here? So choose U to be something. What could that be? Like looking at over here. I want this thing to be 0. U0, let's try the U0. What happens if I actually try the U0? Then it's going to be 0. This, if you're pairing up that 0, is a 0 anyway, right? So think about how to use this one over here. This, this, this is a kind of a condition we have here, and we want to conclude something out of here. Something is equal, some vector is equal to that. So v equals v, that is the idea. v in a product, v in a product is becoming zero. So can we turn that into that by choosing u something? On the left side, like that. You can just choose that and and then use your prime minus u zero, use your prime minus u zero. That it still has to be zero, no matter what. But this is the same vector because of the definiteness. We have u zero prime minus u zero is zero and that is what it's a problem here in the um special relativity theory of einstein and he allows um this inner product matrix be um negative down here negative down here right then you can imagine that you lose this definiteness because uh, for for example like it's a one one a negative one then um, if you do 0, 1, 1 to the product itself, and 1 minus 1 cancels becoming 0. So you would lose that. So what we're losing in here, it means if you do the orthogonal projection, there might be two elements in that orthogonal projection. In, it's indeed true. If you lose that definiteness, your orthogonal projection to the space uh, is going to be two elements. Uh, yeah, that's bad, but uh, in the special relativity, we call it a light cone. We are trapped in this light cone. You cannot travel faster than the speed of light. If you're trapped in that light cone, then there's inside the light, co light cone is a definite. So there is a projection inside the light cone. Things like that. So understanding what property of axiom is playing in what role of, of this theorem is kind of important. So I try to kind of emphasize it here uh, where that plays in. Wow. So we have that. If I have a one vector in arbitrary this inner product space, if I have one vector and there is this one and only one vector that has this property right there, it's orthogonal to everything. That's good. But our real purpose is this one. We wanted to show that is actually the minimal distance. So once this one is done, it's just, it's just amazing. We this this just a few uh, um, axioms. This captures what you see in this three-dimensional space. So here's a proof of two. Is amazing 
simplicity is just another thing. So we have this V given. What is given is V and U0. That means we computed U0. Okay, U0 is the, um, the orthogonal projection. U0 that would have the property. U varies in H, right? And we are considering this quantity, V minus U. What's going to happen to that? V is just fixed it out there. We are trapped in this world of H. And, you know, when is the smallest? So there's this, I don't know, what do you call this one? We want to compare with it V minus U0, right? So, got to have this one back like this. There's a, there's a lot of common technique. This appears a lot. U0 cancels there, right? U0 cancels. So, so it is true. But now you can compare this quantity with that quantity right there. Right? Yeah, so that's right. And it turns out, if you square it, the um, you don't have to deal with the square root of anything. I hope it's clear that minimizing square is the same as minimizing the square root, right? All right. The key thing is that what um, relationship do you see in between this here? This guy is in what space? U is in H, right? U0 came from H. Therefore, is in H. What relationship do you see? V minus U0 and some element in H. Do you see that from number one? V minus U0 and any element in H, they are orthogonal to each other. So because of number one says that, well, no matter what, this is going to be zero. Anything the H you put in there is going to be zero. Very nice. And there was one theorem, not for all metric space, but in a product space, there is this one interesting theorem. There's a triangle inequality that is for all metric space. But there is one theorem interesting for only for inner product space. Squared Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, Pythagorean theorem. So um, this is now sum of two things, right? And the sum splits like this. If these two things are perpendicular to each other or orthogonal to each other, then this square is just the sum of the squares. It's a Pythagorean theorem. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> Well, V is given and U0 is given. This is not changing, right? And only this guy is changing. U is the only thing that's varying. But what can that be? Is a squared. It's a real number squared, right? So that can't exceed this value. That's positive or higher and therefore it should be greater than or equal to. But that's our guy. V minus U0 is always less than or equal to V minus any random guys in the square. I think this is amazing. There's just like, you might think there's a lot more going on to minimality. And that orthogonality is really the essence of this minimum discussion in there. Which you've seen in the Lagrange multiplier in Calc 3. And that thing, you know, equal to each other. All that is this orthogonality. Something optimization is happening is tangential spaces are uh, just uh, this orthogonal condition. So that's some broader statement. All right, so let's go back. There's a complete answer to this one now. If you're looking at finite dimensional vector subspace sitting inside potentially infinite dimensional subspace uh, vector space, this minimum value problem is coming from this u0 that's the answer and one and only answer right it makes it even more unique and interesting and precious one and only answers in there and what is that is this orthogonal projection
So they name it and I introduce that notation. All right, I have V somewhere out there in a ginormous space, infinite dimension space. We put that down to orthogonal and there's always one and only one in there, right? So that was the notation for U0. Now, V can be anything in the vector space as long as H is a finite dimensional and there's a one and only one thing. Therefore, this notation makes sense and also gives you functional notation. PH is going to be a function that takes any vector inside this infinite dimensional vector space all the way down to H. So this is called um, orthogonal projection map and is given by PH V and U0. And those people who are looking at this looking at this definition for the first time wonder what is that U0? Right? So just to make it clear, this U0 is a vector in H such that has what property? V minus U0 is orthogonal to everything that is in H, right? And those people who are looking at this for the first time and they say, how do you know that exists? How do you know there's only one that exists? And that is called well-definedness. All that question is a fundamental question is asked when you define a function like this. So that well-definedness is proved in the earlier statement item number one and number two that I showed earlier. Therefore, this function is well-defined. Mathematicians define function a lot like this, not by an explicit formula, but by property. And then claim that it always exists, <laughs> and there's only one exists that satisfy the property. And theoretical discussion, this is a lot better than dealing with the explicit formulas. Think about that cross product problem that I gave you. So you see the use of this thing. Theoretical discussion is much better. And practical discussion, you want formula, of course. So I guess the formula is the next one I have. This was a homework problem. I don't know. Uh, that was a first advanced problem. Um, so let me um, sketch it again. Computation. Since this is a homework problem, they're still working on it. So let me just sketch it and not actually completely prove it. I thought it's not too bad. Um, computation of PHV, right? So how does it go? V is given. H is given, right? But how do you actually give H? Finite dimensional. Usually specifying a basis member. The key thing is that um, maybe it's given by some equation or whatever, like a polynomial. The things you grab to to find a basis is not necessarily orthonormal basis or orthogonal basis, right? So this method is um, uh, for um, is a method for which we don't actually replace this one with orthog orthogonal basis, which requires Gram-Schmidt process. But if you look into this method, it's not necessarily faster. It is just convenient to code it uh, in, into a program. So idea was was this. Is the idea that um, in theoretically that W is um, span of V plus H not necessarily direct sum if V is outside H and it's a direct sum so in here and there is this E tilde that is a perpendicular to everything that is in you that is an H okay then it turns out and um, you write uh, V 
as a base member and since it's inside and here if it is really inner product I mean drag sum then you can write that V as an element of H which I'm going to call U0 not necessarily without a projection and plus something um, that is inside and here well let me explain this one this one has a dimension L right and W generic case the dimension L plus one right so um, I remember that um, I explained it any time the bilinear pairing equals zero this is linearly independent so I guess I have to write this one down to make this more logical V1 through VL plus that E tilde I found is a basis of a W does it make sense yeah this is a basis of W we have demand L linearly independent and E tilde is supposed to be linearly independent with everything inside in there because of the zero condition we had that before so that's a linearly independent so anything V the V is inside here V is inside here buried somewhere because uh, W has it in it so it must be linear combination of this one I think that's better now to do it this way a1 v1 all the way to al vl plus one more um, thing is al plus one v e tilde all we want is this actually and it turns out because v minus if you set this one u0 v minus u0 don't you think v minus u0 is just this one and that one is always a path, you know, orthogonal to, to zero. So, theory says once you find that kind of V minus zero happen to be orthogonal to everything in H, then that U zero must be the projection. One and only one, right? So it's interesting. Didn't seem like we actually do the usual projection method that I used for the proof of existence. In the proof of um, proof of existence, I replace this v1 through vl with e1 tilde through el tilde, and show that and so on. But here I'm not, and I just use this usual v1 through vl, right? And I show that this is still perpendicular. Then I use the uniqueness. Then that must be it. There was only one and only one that v minus u0 is perpendicular to the everything in u. Therefore, it is. So I circumvent the orthogonal projection, uh, um, orthonormal replacement of that. All I have to do now is, um, well, actually, I was. Uh, I have to just just find this vector right here. Okay. So one vector you want to find. I'm gonna. Um, call that one the V tilde. So V tilde, um, this vector in here is orthogonal to everything. So we have V1, V0 tilde, right? V2, V tilde 0, all the way. And that gives you the equation. And um, if I replace with the negative and, and all that. All right.